Hello. Come on. I know it's 5 o'clock, but bring it up a level a little bit here. This is your wake-up session so you guys can go out and drink tonight. That's my whole purpose. That's why I'm here. <laughs> anyway, uh, you're at Drupal for Customers, a shift in our thinking. Uh, I'm Webb Kenny. They may have, may have seen me present before. I was in London. Um, I was in Chicago. If those of you that made it over there, you shot Nerf darts at me. That's who I am. Talk a little bit more about who I am. Uh, I started in the web in 2002. Uh, I was working on Cold Fusion back then, if you remember that language. That was fun times. I got with Drupal in 2007. I joined Aquia in 2009. And uh, about three and a half years later, I now work with Blink Reaction, a partner of Aquia, as a development firm. So you <coughs> now, of course, naturally, you'll ask what I did before technology. Uh, I did this. I looked a little bit like this, too. I mean, the hair is different now. But I was a carny. I actually worked on a carnival before I, uh, the year before I started in technology. So, yeah. So why should you care about who I am and why should you tweet this session? If you want to tweet this session, the hashtag is D4C. So D, the number four, and C. Easy enough. Drupal for customers. Um, and, you know, why would you care? Why would you tweet this session? Why would you pay attention? Well, now I'm going to lay a little bit of guilt on you and say that today is my two-year wedding anniversary that I am missing to be here in Prague presenting for you people. So can I get a round of applause for that? No. And if you really want to shock my wife, that's her Twitter handle right there. So go ahead and you can all just tweet her randomly. Happy anniversary. Sandal Gale. <laughs> um, anyway, so today we'll talk about my favorite... Uh, my favorite topic, I mean, as my career has always been a developer, um, but always a developer with an eye on customers. That's always what I've done. <clears throat> so in one way or the other, I've been involved in requirements gathering, in some kind of support of customers, and now I help customers with their solutions and run a technology team for a delivery company. So my whole job, while being a coder, has always been about my favorite topic, customers. And they basically say, I'm going to pay you and you're going to solve my problem. Right? So, how many people in here build sites for free? Excellent. That's fantastic. How do you, how do you keep your lights on? We'll talk about that later. Come see me later? All right. <laughs> but no, honestly, customers are such an important part of what we do. Right? Users, customers, there's lots of different words for it. Um, you know, they really are the most important person in your world. And even for those who build free sites, users are your most important people. And, you know, that gets forgotten. Forgotten. There's a lot of different types of customers that we work with. Uh, you know, there are what I like to call sort of the technically challenged customer. All right. There's also the know-it-all customer. Uh, we'll talk about each of those. So the technically challenged customer calls you at, you know, 2.30 in the morning and says, my website won't come up. And you say, well, is your internet cable plugged in? Right? Uh, and they say, oh, yeah, no, it isn't. Thanks. Let me call my IT guy. Uh, and the know-it-all customer, of course, is that customer that did computer science 15, 20 years ago. They built little, you know, something, little screens for, a, for an ATM machine. And uh, now, of course, they can tell you everything that they know about UX and how to build websites. Right? Uh, but I do assert to you that there's one thing that will keep every customer happy, no matter what, and that is being transparent with them. All right, that is it's transparency. It's the most important thing around what we do. Uh, I'm a big believer in teaching customers. I think that too often as developers, as technical people, we get into sort of this, this way, all right? We get into this way where we feel like we know something you don't, and so therefore, that's job security for us. <laughs> but truthfully, it's a lot easier to work with smarter customers. So we have to make our customers smarter. <clears throat> so what I've done is I've actually taken time sometimes to explain Git to a customer. I've actually explained a database to a customer, you know, to sort of give them that edge so that they can feel as though they can have a conversation with me. And I show them Drupal. I do it every day. So today we're going to talk about the Drupal site life cycle, okay? Uh, not the technical life cycle. So if there are, you know, if you're expecting to hear about hooks in here and libraries and include files, you should leave now. <laughs> All right. We're going to talk about the Drupal site life cycle in terms of what it's like to build them. All right, and we're going to talk about five stages today. Uh, selling, planning, building them, deploying, and then contributing. All right, I see the five of those as basically being the, the key five things. Now, under those five areas, there could be any number of subtopics. I mean, we could talk about sales for an entire session. I could talk about uh, performance for an entire session, and I have. 
But first, let's talk about the old way. All right, the pre the pre open source way that we used to build websites, and many websites are still built this way today. Does anybody uh, remember this from computer science school? Yeah. So this is the old SDLC. Okay. It is this concept. They also call it waterfall. All right. It's the process where you analyze requirements and you go through and quote, and then you do a mock up, and then you create it and you stage it and release it, and then you go back to the beginning and do it again. Now. What is wrong with a, this particular approach? Can anyone tell me? What happens in, in, in websites when you build them in waterfall? No? I'll tell you. Basically, software is like childbirth, all right? You wait nine months for something, and then the screaming starts, all right? That's effectively what, it, what it's like when it's built that way, all right? So, and a lot of that is because we, we sort of, we don't know what the customer wants when the customer asks for it. They don't know what the customer wants when they ask for it. You know, they don't even know what they want. So let's talk through how we can sort of break through that a little bit. The first thing is selling it. How do you sell Drupal? Okay, how do you sell this sort of, we all come to DrupalCon, we, you know, we throw down a bunch of money, we travel from all over the world. We love Drupal, right? We, we bleed blue. It's so exciting for us to walk through the halls and talk to people and meet people, but our customers, they don't really know the inside of Drupal, so how do you sell it? The first thing you have to be comfortable with before you begin even your first Drupal project is this. You're already awesome, <laughs> right? You're already excellent because you're as, as much an assembler as you are a coder. So, you know, there are some people out there who can write custom modules. I'm one of them. There are others who are just site builders. There are folks who are themers. There are folks who literally just can assemble modules together and understand requirements. You know, what you have to remember in the Drupal space is that people are actually, or actually this is open source in general, but they're paying for your ability to distill the complexity for them. That's what they're paying for you to do. All right, yeah, they're also paying you to write code, sure. They're also paying you to launch their site, absolutely. But they really are paying you to, to distill it and to make it less complex. So you don't have to be Dries to be very successful. You want to stand out from the crowd, all right, by engaging with your customers. You want to contribute to the community, collaborate with everyone around you, all right? And finally, you want to be the best, all right? You need to attend trainings. You're already halfway there. Here you are at DrupalCon. Give yourselves a round of applause for that, yeah? You're already halfway there. So you're here at DrupalCon. You go to Drupal camps. You go to meetups. You're already sort of moving towards being the best. Soaking up as much knowledge as possible in this space, and you will be. It's about as much, uh, it's actually as much about your ambition to build something great as it is your ability to build it. That actually, you know, it's called outcome visioning. We're going to talk about that too later. All right, now it's the quiz part of our, you ready for the quiz? This is the quiz part of our, uh, of our session. So everybody in here knows what the GPL is, I would assume. Yeah, obviously, I would hope so. However, we shouldn't be here. <laughs> so let me ask you a question. Uh, and just by show of hands, are you forced to redistribute all of your Drupal code? Raise your hand if it's yes. Okay. Can you sell the Drupal source code with your modifications and or the executable? Raise your hand for yes. Okay. Can you distribute the GPL code with proprietary code without distributing the source of the proprietary code? Raise your hand for no. Okay. See, we don't really know GPL all that well. <laughs> Let's go back. First of all, you're not ever forced to redistribute your Drupal code. That's a no. All right. So you guys, most of it, you got that right. The second one, can you sell the Drupal source code? You absolutely can. There are many people who have made lots and lots of money because what I, what I have dealt with when I built projects for people where it's there, the next great Facebook, right? Because everybody has the next Facebook. They're, it's going to be awesome. We're going to have puppies and pictures and it's going to be fantastic. The first question that I get is, <clears throat> well, Kenny, if you're going to build this with open source, what's going to happen six months from now or, you know, when, because that's all it's going to take is six months. What's going to happen six months from now when Microsoft comes to buy my idea? Can I sell this? And the answer is yes, you can. Um, there we go. All right. <laughs> so the good news is this. Very simple. Here it is. When you run your proprietary software, written in PHP, Drupal, on Linux, and MySQL, it does not mean you have to redistribute your proprietary source code. It just means that should you choose to, re to distribute it, you have to distribute it under the original terms of the GPL. That's it. So you never have to redistribute it. You could sell it to five people. But if you decide to, that's when you get into licensing. But I want you to remember one very important thing about this session, which is I'm not a lawyer, all right? So if you have questions about your particular project, you should call your lawyer. <laughs> they know better than I do. 
So that's licensing, all right? Now the next thing is to talk about the sort of, this is a tough one for people to digest, customers at least, which is the evolution of our project. Our project changes so frequently. I used to do support for Acquia back in the day and I used to joke and I'd say, doing support for Acquia is like being a dog chasing a ball attached to a pickup truck. You're never actually gonna reach the truck but you're always gonna stay directly behind it, all right? And the reason for that is because every single day, something in the community changes, right? Views yesterday is not what it was, it is today. There's a new patch, there's something new, there's something that's gonna break. That's just how open source is, not really Drupal, although Drupal certainly seems to move at a much faster pace, it appears. Not major versions, but that's a whole separate talk. Um, <laughs> uh, so you really have to tell your customers to embrace the change, all right? Embrace the change of Drupal and you know, talk to them about the changes and teach them to sort of accept the fast moving pace. And how do you say that? And you know, the good news is there's a, uh, an upside to this, which is that because it changes so much, it means when they change their mind, and they will, you'll be able to change with it, okay? They will change their mind. <laughs> Obviously, three months ago, they didn't know then what they know today. So it basically means instead of charging maybe $50,000 for a site you build in 10 weeks, maybe you're charging them $2,000 a week until the project is done. You know, there are sort of ways to, to look at that. There are, there's fixed price, there's time and materials, there's all sorts of ways to structure it. There was a great session earlier today about that, I won't go into it. But you basically have to structure your pricing model around the way that Drupal moves and around the way that your development shop can move. All right, now let's talk about planning. All right, um, so this is the dreading, dreaded planning stage, uh, you know, which is how do we know what we're gonna build if we're gonna do this just a little bit at a time? What about specs and requirements and how do we get into that? <laughs> so the first thing is, I'm gonna say this, <laughs> bold. If you're not talking to your customers, you are boring them, okay? You are actually boring your customers when you get on the phone when you don't get on the phone with them and you let weeks elapse between conversations as you go off into a hole and build something or plan something. You know, if you're not comfortable talking to customers, you probably should find another job because this is the new breed of developer. All right, 25 years ago, it was different, right? Coders 25, 30 years ago, they could spend all their lives, you know, at a computer basically hacking out code all day. And that's still true to some degree. I mean, there's still some, you know, there's some, some people that can do that, but I think that the more you want to advance in this, in this sort of, um, in this business, the more you want to advance in web development, the more you want to advance up your career, become a better developer, become an architect, become a lead, you know, whatever you're gonna do, you have to get comfortable talking. Obviously, I'm comfortable talking, I talk too much. <clears throat> but you really want to get the conversations down, you want to record them if you need to, you want to reference them when you talk to them again. And probably the most important thing is listen to your customers. Your customers know what they're talking about, all right? Even though we think they don't, they really truly do. Because they know their customers, right? Now, what usually happens when people hear the word planning? How do you react? All right, this is usually how most people react to, oh, we have to plan it. All right, well, we sold this website. We're gonna have all this money, but how, what are we gonna do? How are we gonna plan it? Well, here's the thing. So instead of panicking, I am going to tell you that you have the greatest planner in the world and you don't have to spend a single nickel on anything else. You're sitting with it right now. Your brain, <laughs> all right? Your brain is an amazing planner, all right? It has this little thing which you can look up when I'm done to see if I'm talking jazz, but I'm actually, I'm not, this is true. You have this little thing in your brain called the reticular filter. And it's this little part of your brain, basically, that when you focus on something, it will give you all the data that you need about that particular item. All right, so let's test that out right now. All right, everybody in here, just close your eyes. Bear with me for a second, close your eyes. Now, tell me where there's red in the room. Spot red in the room. In your, in your, just in your mind. Got it? Okay, open your eyes. All right, great. One more time, close your eyes, blue. Where is there blue in the room? All right, so there's more blue in the room than there is actually red, all right? As a proportion of color, blue is actually the, the color that you probably see the most standing up here. It's in my presentation, it's here, it's on the carpet, right? But while I was asking you about red, blue was there the whole time. You just weren't looking at blue, you were looking at red. And so what I try to assert to you with that is that when you focus on a particular problem, your brain will do the work for you. But it's all about actually sitting down to focus. <clears throat> So we're gonna talk about something called the natural planning model, all right? The natural planning model is consisted of five steps, 
All right. Uh, you know, you could easily probably break these down into words, why, what, how, organize, and action. Okay, that's sort of the natural planning model of how things go. And sure, you know, this, what I'm talking about, this could turn into a specification. That, you know, all these, these planning steps that I refer to could actually turn into a 25-page spec that you put in front of a developer. But how you get to that spec is what's important. Uh, the first step in the model is to define your purpose and principle. Why are we here? Why are we building this site? The immediate answer for most people who get paid by developers is money. So if that's your motivation, fine. But really, it's why your customer is building the site. Why are they building it? The second is outcome visioning. So there's a lot of studies out there that show that uh, Olympic athletes, they actually do most of their training visioning the goal that they're going to make before they actually go out and do it. All right, there are studies that suggest that doing that makes them a better athlete. And so we're athletes, we're code athletes, just because we don't all go out running. I mean, I certainly can't run. I took the elevator up and down the stairs you know, all day today. I, didn't, I don't think I got on the stairs once. But I still vision when something's going to be successful. And that's what we have to do. The third step is brainstorming. All right, I mean, I think brainstorming gets short-circuited when we develop because a lot of the times, we, especially as developers, and I do this, you know, I spend a lot of time wondering, what's a good idea, right? What's a good idea? And automatically, my brain shuts down because I know deep down I probably don't have the, you know, I think I don't have the capacity for the good idea. But the thing is, you have to have a lot of bad ideas before you have a lot of good ideas, all right? So what I would, what I would encourage you to do to prove that theory for yourself is to go back, because it's out there, and take a look at Drupal 1, <laughs> okay? Go back and look at Drupal 1. We all know Drupal today, it's so awesome, it's all these APIs, fantastic. But go look at the terrible idea that Drupal 1 was, and Drupal 2, and Drupal 3, right? It was a good idea, but it eh, wasn't executed all that well. A lot of bad ideas before we got to where we are today. Uh, the fourth step is organizing. So once you get all that brainstorming done, you get it all out into the open, all right? You then have to figure out how you're going to organize all those thoughts. Now, how do you brainstorm? You could do it any way you want. You can use a piece of paper. I use a mind mapping software. You could do something as easy as popping open Microsoft Word and taking an outline. There's a lot of different ways you could do it. But basically, the whole exercise I just taught you on blue and red, you basically do that. You think to yourself, login feature. What are the things that go with a login feature? Well, I'm going to need a form. Probably going to need some theming done. Right? Oh, I may need to uh, make sure that they don't want it to integrate with their external systems if they're a big company. Things like that. And the last and fifth step really is to identify the actions that come out of that. Right? So once you determine that you have to build a theme, that's your action. Build a theme. You know, uh, maybe you need to go find a theme first. If you're going to build a sub-theme of something and it's going to be responsive, then maybe your first thing is actually going out and finding what you're going to use to build this. So let's have some fun. Does anybody in here have a website they have to build that they haven't started yet? Yeah? Excellent. You want to be a, a test subject for me right here in the third row? You mind? Uh, all right, just stand up for me. All right, first of all, tell us about the website you're building. I'll repeat it over the microphone. Yeah, it's an e shop for some kind of and just, you know, stuff. Okay, so it's, a, it's an e commerce store? Yeah. yeah? All right, great. What's one of the features that you have to build on that? A cart? Shopping cart? Okay. So, by show of hands, and I'll call on you, what's the first thing that comes to mind when you think about a shopping cart? Go ahead, raise your hands. Everybody in this room, shopping cart. Payment gateway. Payment gateway. What else? Products. Products, right. What else? Security. Security. There we go. I knew there was an Aquian in the room. <laughs> <laughs> He's hiding back there. He's actually taller than all of you. <laughs> uh, all right, security, good. What else? What else comes to mind? Usability. Usability. Awesome. Great. We have a designer in here. So um, you can sit down. You don't have to stand the whole time. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> um, but the point being, you know, we just got four really good ideas, all right? Four things in here that we have to think about. Usability, security, products, right? A payment gateway. Now we have to go out and we have to create actions on those things. Well, payment gateways. We've got Authorized Net. We've got PayPal. We've got a lot of different things we could use. We could integrate with somebody else's system. We could build our own if we wanted to. And then we sort of, then we identify the actions that are based on that, right? So what are the actions involved in choosing a payment gateway? You're probably going to do some Googling, <laughs> you know? Maybe you're going to hop in IRC and ask what people use. Maybe you're going to go look at the issue queues and see what modules are well supported, that sort of thing. <clears throat> now you have to actually build what you said you were going to build, right? So after you've, after you've planned it and you've sold it, now you have to build it, all right? Now here's the good thing. 
in Drupal, we don't have to build everything from the ground up, right? That's why we love this platform. But how do you choose what to build when there's so many choices, right? How do you know, like today, I think that this, I don't know what the actual statistic is, but I know a few that I've seen. I can think of, at least at the top of my head, probably four or five image galleries today in Drupal 7. All right, I'm sure that there are probably 15 or 20 or 30. I don't know how many there are. I don't want to spit out a statistic, but I've seen probably four or five. So how do you make the choices around which one you're going to use, right? Well, you have a couple of ways to do that. You can find it by hand. You can go to Drupal.org, and you can search Drupal.org for keywords, and you can see, see if anything pops up. And you can find it by accident, right? You can find it by accident on Drupal Planet. There's a feed on Twitter that I subscribe to called Drupal Modules that basically will, every time a module is posted, it pops up on the, on the screen what the module is. And you know, I see it sometimes, and if I'm working on something and it pops up, that sort of happenstance, but it doesn't always happen. Um, also, the support forums in Drupal.org, you, know, you can see it in the form of questions from other users about their requirements. Many of the cool things I learned about when I was first starting in Drupal and Drupal 5, I just got by trolling the forums and seeing how other people did it. You know, simple enough. And in the Drupal 5 days, we weren't clearly as huge as we are today, right? I mean, that was like, you know, beginning of Drupal 5, not nearly as many people. Um, the other way is the Drupal Showcase. Uh, this will be posted, by the way, after, and I'll have all these links for you. Uh, but the Drupal Showcase is another place. You know, these are places, these are case studies, effectively, around sites that have been built with Drupal. You know, not invented here. So, you know, we talk, Dries talked about that in the keynote. Same is true when we build sites, right? I mean, we, we don't really, um, we don't want to go through we don't want to go through building a, a thing custom again. Now you have to evaluate. Okay, you found the perfect module. This has happened to me many times. I found, oh, I need, um, I need Flow Player. I need the Flow Player on my site. I found the Flow Player module. I'm so excited. I didn't get a 404 when I went to the link. Page loads. Oh, there hasn't been a commit in 68 weeks. All right, and there's 5,000 open issues in the queue. What do I do now? All right. Um, Here's how you can basically give some general sense around how this works. If the last updated date of the latest release is several months in the past, then it could indicate a few things. It could indicate that there's a lack of maintainer activity, right? And interest in the module, it's possible. It could also mean you found an example of a completely perfect module and nothing needs to be done, right? But that's not usually the case. So the other thing you can look at is usage statistics. You can go look and see, all right, well, here's a module that really hasn't been used in a long time or hasn't been committed to in a long time. So you go and then you see, well, how many people are using it? You know, there are actually some really excellent modules out there that are really rock solid that are being used on tens of thousands of sites but haven't seen a commit in six months, and that's okay. You know, so it's all about sort of evaluating in that way. This is an article that never really gets old, this one here. Uh, it's sort of, you know, how to choose modules for a Drupal installation. Uh, it was written by Angie, so it's a really a great, great one. Also, when you're building, you know, you have to be honest about design. Looks matter, of course, you know, in a, in, a, in a design. Now, whether you're a designer or not, that's fine. You know, it's all about negotiating with the customers on what they're willing to pay for, what resources you have, what resources they have. Uh, a lot of people will come at you and say, we've got a really rock-solid designer, and uh, he really wants to learn Drupal, so he's going to do that on this project, and you're just going to build the modules for him. Right, and we all know how that typically goes. Not all that well. <laughs> so what I suggest is, you know, certainly we have this concept in development of fixed cost, right? We get an RFP from a customer, and it's 22 pages long, and it's got all these requirements we have to do, and we basically have to come up with a magic number, right? We have to guess. So it's going to take us, well, hold on, 5,000 hours, right? You just make it up. And you know, it's based on past history, it's based on past experience, obviously, it's based on past numbers. There's lots of ways we do that. But in the end, really, you should iterate and build it agile even if the project is a fixed cost. Now, how can you do that? You know, how can you have a conversation with customers that says, well, you've asked for these 15 features, okay? And I can build these 15 features. It's going to take us 25 hours to do that. Or if you're willing to sacrifice this feature and that feature, I can give you the five-star module, and we'll do it out of the box, right? So this is where conversations with customers come in. You have to know your work. You have to know Drupal. You have to be able to talk confidently about that. And so that's why the learning that you do when you first start off in this kind of development really cannot be understated. It's so important.
Then you have to launch it, right? There's always there's the sort of the launching process and you have to scale it. If you're gonna do sites for any, any large business, you effectively have to scale the, um, you have to scale the site at some point, right? And people might say, well, why does scaling matter? I mean, well, I guess we could all say, we all know why scaling matters, but customers sometimes would be like, why does scaling matter? And the truth is that, you know, when people consume information, they become bored very easily, all right? And see what I mean? <laughs> like, it's a very boring process to just sort of sit there and wait and read and do those sort of things. Now, what happens if we don't scale websites, right? What if we don't care about caching and we just throw a site out the door? No one cares about scaling it. What usually happens? All right, the site goes up in horrible flames and goes down, right? So let's talk a little bit about caching. I'm gonna keep it a little high level because this isn't a super technical session, but I do wanna talk a little bit about some of the things you can do off the shelf to help you with, uh, with this stuff. So caching comes in a lot of flavors in Drupal. All right, uh, I think that it's become a lot more important in Drupal 6 and Drupal 7 as we've been exposed to the enterprise more in Drupal 5, maybe not as much, <coughs> although one of these modules has been around since 4. Um, so the first one is Drupal's default database cache, right? That's those tables for those developers in the room. You've seen these. They have the cache prefix. And, you know, those, that's basically your, your caching system. Interestingly, <coughs> the only one that actually gets affected by, the only one that gets served to your users really is cache block and cache page. Everything else is all caching for the system itself. When you turn off, um, this is like one of those annoying things as developers you notice, like when you turn off caching and, you, and yet you still see things that are cached, that's because there are other caches in your system that are still working because they're just to make Drupal faster a little bit. Uh, and can somebody tell me in here, if you're technical and you know those tables, there's a particular table that actually is not a cache. Can somebody tell me which one that is? So it's cache form, right? So if people see cache form and they think that that's a cache, it actually isn't. It's what's called a state machine. So it's what prevents, it's what enables you actually to go from page three of a form to page four and not lose your place. It's, a, it's an ill-named table in the Drupal space. The next thing is an object cache. This is really technical, but I'll just, you know, I'll sort of leave it to you to go research this. This is, so this is one of those questions you want to ask if you're building a high availability website or you're building a site for a large customer, you want to ask, does your host have? Right, so one of the things that you would be asking is, does your host have APC? It's not marked up here, but it is something that it should be, you know, looked into. So it's APC if you were taking notes. And that's an opcode cache, all right? Effectively, that makes PHP run faster. It's the easiest way to say it. Uh, memcache is a little bit different. That's an object cache. And so what memcache does is it takes all those fancy tables I just told you about, and it basically gets rid of those and puts everything into the system RAM. And obviously things are gonna move faster between the CPU and the RAM than they are between the CPU and the database. So again, you don't really have to know what it does. All you really have to know if you're more on the business side is does your hosting have this or are we offering a hosting package that has this? <coughs> Then for the hackers in the room or the folks who are actually doing the implementation, there's something called a static file cache. This is one of my favorite modules, actually, and I think it gets sort of understated uh, in the world of, of varnish and reverse proxies, which I'll talk about next. But um, this actually can be used with a varnish. You know, this, this, this is a really powerful module called Boost. And what Boost does is it basically goes through your database, or goes through, yeah, goes through your database, picks all the things that should be cached, and then creates HTML copies of them. Right? It goes through and it just creates copies in folders in your files directory. So it's a very useful module, and I've been using it for three versions now. Now people will say, well, wait a minute, Kenny, I have Varnish, so who cares about Boost? Well, the thing is that Boost actually a lot, can have a, a much longer lifetime than Varnish can. So let's say, Var well, not can, Varnish can have an endless lifetime, but the point is, if you want to set your Varnish cache to be, let's say, 60 seconds, but you want your the cache underneath it to, to persist longer, you can do that. And you can use all sorts of fancy modules out there like cache actions and rules and all these things to say, because uh, there's always a marketing person that says, I can't use caching. I'm sorry, but when I write a blog post, it must be up immediately. All right, well, the good news is there is a solution for that problem, okay? <laughs> there is a solution for that problem, and it's called cache actions. It's a very easy module to implement, and effectively it says, when something is updated, clear the cache for this one node. Right? And then they get their fresh blog post and the site doesn't come to their knees. I mean, sometimes if you want to just be a jerk, you can say, all right, I'll turn off caching then. <laughs> you know, but you're, you're going to get a call at 2 in the morning. So. <clears throat> and then there's the big boys, right? Or there's the big people to keep it, to keep it uh, androgynous. But there's <laughs> Varnish, Squid, 
Nginx, Apache Proxy, uh, Akamai. I mean, I could go on forever. You know, there's, I don't know, what's the other one with the lime in the name? I can't think of it. But there, these are the proxy caches. These are like, you know, clusters of machines or machines or servers that are software that is entirely powered to do caching. Now, a reverse proxy and a CDN are a little different, absolutely. But believe it or not, in most, in, in, Akamai's default configuration is really nothing more than varnish with 50,000 servers. That's, it's really the same thing. And what these do is they sit in front of your website and they basically take traffic instead of sending it back to the web server. So it's a really good, you know, it's a really good way to, <clears throat> to have a high availability website. And there are a lot of hosts out there today that already have this stuff. So you don't really have to think about that. All right, now I don't work for them anymore, but I do believe that one of the greatest hosting platforms out there is Acquia Cloud. You can disagree with me if you want. We'll fight all day afterwards, that's fine. But, <laughs> but I do think that's great. Pantheon's also another excellent pro project. All right, also a really great product that you can get. And these are already built to scale, okay? They already have all the things I just mentioned and the kitchen sink, all right? So you don't really have to worry too much about what your, what your code is gonna do once it gets to production once it gets to stage, is it gonna scale? The answer is yes. So if your customer is willing to spend the money, it's out there. If they're, if they're not willing to spend the money, and this happens, right? I assure you there are tons of ways to squeeze every little uh, piece that you can out of the hosting before you actually have to get into a multi-availability setting. There really are. You know, there's all sorts of ways you can do it. You can layer Boost and Varnish and Memcache and APC and every other caching technology you want. And quite honestly, as long as you're not getting like, you know, thousands of hits per minute, you'll stand up. You know, Drupal can do a lot of really powerful things. Like, I'm a famous guy, right? You know me. I'm famous? No? All right. Well, my website gets like, you know, <laughs> I mean, it's a, it's a lot of traffic, my website. At least 25 hits a month. And 23 of them are my mother. But the truth is, the hosting that I'm on uh, is a little shared hosting. But I have my site set up in such a way that if I do some tweet that's like so super awesome that it gets like tons of retweets and everybody's on my blog, I can handle it. You know, I can handle it. Now I can handle it to a point. You know, obviously I only pay about 20 bucks a month for that hosting because I'm cheap. You know, and at some point I would have to upgrade. But the point is you can squeeze an awful lot out. You know, and I think that, I think what we get to, to do, you know, and I'll come off this in a second, but I think what we end up doing all too often is <clears throat> as developers or as technical people, I should say, as people who are in the technical field, we tend to think about scale before scale is even necessary, right? How many times have we thought about this idea and said, huh, if you get mentioned on Oprah, you're gonna be, it's gonna be over. You know, I mean, what are we gonna do then? You know, uh, sites don't actually blow up overnight. That's a fairy tale. They don't actually usually do that. And I've worked on a lot of sites and they usually ramp. You can tell when it's coming. Sometimes it happens, but sometimes, you know, but most of the time it doesn't. <laughs> you know, and most of the businesses out there, they know when they're gonna be on CNN because they're all watching. <laughs> so you'll know ahead of time. I think probably one of the more challenging conversations to have with customers is around contribution, okay? Uh, they talk about how, you know, why should I pay you to contribute to the open source project? Or, you know, why should my ideas become part of the Drupal source project, uh, open source project Drupal? And a lot of, you know, I like to tell the story of IBM. Does everybody, everybody knows IBM, of course, right? Worldwide company. Um, they did something 20 years ago called the Linux Technology Center. Has anybody in here heard of it by show of hands? Great. So what they did is this huge company, okay, is they made an investment. They knew that they were gonna, they were gonna use Linux in their organization. And actually today, Acquia does something like this. They have called it OCTO, but it's very similar. And effectively what they did was <laughs> they brought into their organization all the best Linux core developers and they paid them full time to work on Linux. They made an investment in open source. And IBM at the time that they did this was dying, right? They were on their way up because they were part, they were, they were really part of the, of the they, their PCs weren't really very good and there was a lot of other competitors out there that were sort of edging them out. And by investing in open source, today they are, they are one of the world leaders in, in, in open source, if not the world leader, really. You know, in terms of what they produce and what they give to people. So that's a fun story to tell. You can look it up on Wikipedia and you can tell your customers that. But also, you know, there's an investment that they make in the future of their product by contributing back to Drupal. That's an easy conversation to have, right? It's easy to say, <laughs> okay, well, all we really need to do is contribute this little piece, you know? And here's the thing. You can believe that the more that they have to come to you for work, the more money you're going to make. But the truth is, the more that they have to come to you for every little thing, the more you're gonna annoy each other, <laughs> okay? That's what's gonna happen. Like I have clients today that I've had for, you know, 
I have like a guy that I used to work with five years ago who to this day I still deal with. He still sends me emails once in a while. And I'm the kind of guy because I'm like always in development, so I like something new and fresh and you know, whatever. I'm the kind of guy that like doesn't want customers around that long. <laughs> like I don't like them around five or ten years. I know I'm like a I'm a CEO's worst nightmare. But truthfully, that's kind of how I am. I like to build it and move on, right? I'm a technologist. That's what I like to do. The next shiny, bright thing is my new thing. And so what I tend to when I tend to have conversations with customers, I sort of center it around you know, if we release this into the community, then you will have more developers working on this for free. And customers love the word free, right? And so you have to explain that to them. You have to explain that process. Because ultimately, one person cannot do it all, all right? I mean, we can't just have sort of, you know, one, 10, 20. What did they say today in the keynote that it was 1,700 people who contributed to Drupal 8? Is that what I heard? Yeah. So 1,700 people, right? That's not enough. That's not enough. We just heard from Dries this morning that Drupal 8 will be ready when it's ready, but he estimates it'll be early 2014. I don't know if anybody of you were at the keynote last year at this time, but it was supposed to be when? This year. Now. We should have already had it. <laughs> right? so, so clearly, and that's okay. I mean, open source moves a little slow, but in order to, in order to move it faster, you know, he said probably a fantastic quote this morning about being, I can't even quote it directly, but about, you know, we can move quicker as one, as one and we move further as a group. I'm, I'm paraphrasing. But the truth is, when it comes to open source, when it comes to models, when it comes to the sustainability of a customer's product, they have to understand that open source process, so you have to understand that open source process. You have to live it. And when that doesn't work, there's really only, other, there's really only other, one other way you can do it. You have to just beg, plead, prove, and bribe. All right, that's really all you can do. All right, or basically stay up at night and contribute on your own time. <laughs> okay, that's effectively what you have to do. Sometimes you can't get paid to do it, so you have to do it on your own. All right. All right, so this wasn't meant to be a very long session. Uh, it was only meant to be about 40 minutes, and it looks like I'm a couple minutes under, so I will open up the floor. I'm sure a lot of you have customers right now. Anybody have questions? This is brilliant. No questions? No? None? Yes. All right. That's, I mean, not yes. I mean, I'd love to answer them, but I've never had a session without questions before. Uh, you know why? This isn't a very technical session. So if I'd had a technical session, everybody would have been up to the mic challenging my whole technical thing and my point of view. Anyway, so thank you very much for coming to this session. I hope it was somewhat enjoyable. Um, and if you liked it, by all means, tweet. Go fill out a survey. Let me know what you did like, what you didn't like, what I left out, all that good stuff. And have a good time in Prague. Thank you. Thank you.